check check here we are let's do this what's good it's woog we've got devin haney 31 wins zero losses defending his wbc super lightweight title against ryan garcia 24 wins and one loss these two have been on a collision course pretty much since the amateurs since their childhoods really and several years later here we are and you know during the build-up to this fight I had serious doubts whether this fight was actually going to happen. I mean, we're currently in fight week, but I was thinking that this fight was about to be derailed and called off because some of the, the, the pretty erratic and seemingly wild and concerning behavior from Ryan Garcia to the point where I just did a standalone video essentially about the state of Ryan Garcia. And I think that a lot of the concerns stem from the second press conference that they had where Ryan Garcia seemed kind of out of sorts, erratic. He wasn't his normal self. He wasn't the same self he was just the day prior when they had that first press conference. So he seemed inebriated. That's when he said, you know, I don't do coke, but I smoke and drink that press conference. And then his behavior immediately after that in the days to follow some of his uh twitter or x behavior um when he would feature on social media platforms some of the things that he was saying were extremely uh disturbing um in terms of what he said you know happened to him as a toddler basically as a baby and what he was forced to witness it was just really really bizarre and i was just thinking like many were thinking what the hell is going on here so there hasn't been a ton of transparency into his camp aside from what he puts out there via social media. So he'll have himself jogging. He'll have himself hitting bags, working with, you know, Derek James and sometimes TikTok dances or, you know, trash talking. But he scaled it back in terms of what he was doing around the time of the press conference and what he was saying around that time. Sometimes he'll come out and kind of say something more broadly, more generally in terms of what he stands for, what he's fighting against. But he's not getting as specific. I don't know if people around him kind of reeled him in. I don't know if he's kind of self-corrected his behavior. I don't know if he is a lot more erratic still than what he's been presenting as of late in terms of the most recent of days. Like, has he kind of cooled it or is he misleading us with just giving us you know the the moments where he seems like he's together I, I have no idea you listen to oscar interview him he will say you know what you would expect ryan garcia's promoter to say you know he's looking great when he's you know working out when he's in camp and you know i think he's going to be ready this is like a big fight and you listen to different people you'll hear different things but look Again, I didn't think the fight was going to happen, and I did see him recently pop up at the Nate Diaz, Jorge Masvidal press conference and, you know, just say a whole bunch of things about what he's going to do to Devin Haney. He danced before he got off the stage. He backed his homie, and that was that. But that's all stuff more so within the line of the normal promotional cycle things that fighters normally do so that's not with that's not outside of the realm of the the norm so again here we are like it looks like haney versus garcia is going down and you know the betting odds pretty much reflect the perception of both of these fighters like you've got devin haney who's been checking all of the boxes correctly you know from his you know early pro career instead of going the olympic route fighting in, fighting in tijuana building up you know some record and some experience fighting you know grown men as like a 16 and a half 17 year old and then just kind of working his way up in incrementally i remember people were kind of criticizing his strength of schedule back when he was like 21 years old like hey when is he gonna fight some you know serious a-level guys because this is when they were talking about you know the four you know princes you know it was four kings but then they kind of scaled it back with Javante Davis who's a little bit older than the others Teofimo Lopez who's got about a year or two on Haney and Garcia then you had Haney Garcia and then Shakur Stevenson who was always a, a division or two below them like when they were at lightweight he was at 126 but people saw him as being as good as the others so Ever since that, you know, you got to keep in mind, Devin Haney was like 21, 22 years old. So he was fighting, you know, uh, an aging Yor Yorkies Gamboa. He had just captured a belt beating up on Zayor Abdulayev, who you can see who's been elevating in the division at 135. So that's a that's a win that's aging pretty well. But, you know, I was thinking as he's then fighting Jorge Linares and Jojo Diaz. I'm, I'm thinking this guy's right on schedule, if not way ahead of schedule. 
Keep in mind, he's 21, so I think that the boxing public was being a little bit irrational at the time, like, oh, he's fighting these guys, and it's like, give the kid some time, you know what I mean? And then we saw the rest play out. We saw his back-to-back -back dominations over George Cambosos out in, you know, Melbourne, Australia to capture the titles, to then defend the titles, you know, back-to-back -back fights dominating Camboso. so that changed a lot. And then he had the, the showdown with Vasily Lomachenko. Controversial, unanimous decision win. The public's been divided on this since the fight. And this is one of those fights that's always going to be discussed and seen as a disputed win. But hey, if nothing else, it was a pretty damn even fight. I thought Haney won by a round, maybe two, but probably by a round over Loma. He finished strong too, by the way. He won that 12th round after having nearly disastrous 10th and 11th rounds where Lomachenko seemingly won those pretty clearly. Haney finished strong, which told me a lot about his character. So after that, whether you thought he deserved to win or not, again, it was a very good and competitive fight with one of the greats in Lomachenko. And so I feel like reputation wise, he's just been stepping up that ladder to where even like the biggest naysayers have to be like, yeah, he's pretty tough to win rounds against. He being Devin Haney. And that further showed itself in his next fight at the Chase Center in the Bay Area against 140 pound WBC champ Regis Progre in a fight that I attended I was that was a really fun experience and it was cool to see how much love Devin Haney was getting in his hometown in the Bay Area I know he's also from Vegas but he got a lot of love at the Chase Center and he won every round against Regis Progre I look even people who thought that Haney was going to win that fight I don't think that we saw that level of domination taking place where he dropped Progre in like the, what was it, the third round thereabout. And he hurt Progre a couple times later on in the fight where he got Progre kind of a little bit stiff legged and looking like, wait, is how is Progre doing? This was a, a, an impressive domination and he seemed to be hitting harder in the division up which a lot of people suspected might be the case because of how much he seemed to be draining himself at lightweight for a few fights so Haney seems to really be coming into his own right now and I think most people right now would have him ranked in their top five top six if you don't have him in your top eight I would have to really question your pound for pound rankings and the rationale behind him but Devin Haney is looking remarkable right now. And again, career-wise, he's just checking all of the boxes, which, you know, makes Bill Haney also look very, very impressive in how they, as a team, have been navigating Devin Haney's career. They've been making a lot of the right calls, taking the right gambles. And then, of course, Devin Haney, in all of these instances, has to get into the ring and execute on those gambles. Again, he's still undefeated. He's now got that king-making win over Lomachenko he's got that division up win domination over one of the guys one of the two or three guys who was kind of the class of the division in the we will say the post Terrence Crawford era at 140 in Regis Progre Haney dusted him off no problem and yes it will then beg the question well where is Regis Progre in his career because we saw him look unimpressive in his prior fight against Danielito Zaria so there will always be the well how good was Progre when he fought Devin Haney and things Devin Haney still did what he did I don't think that we could take that or should take that away from him so we've got that in being Devin Haney's reputation compared to Ryan Garcia's reputation of such unevenness. It's, it, look, especially after his win against Luke Campbell, which was his last fight under the tutelage of Eddie Reynoso and with, you know, Team Canelo. He then took that hiatus that he attributed to mental health, getting his mind right, which was another thing that made some of what he was saying it, look, if people thought that he was trolling with what he was saying in more recent months when he, with his pretty dramatically bizarre talk and disturbing talk, if he was trolling, then that would be one of the most despicable things you could think of given how seriously he was talking about taking care of your mental health just a couple of years prior. So that would be extremely hypocritical. That's why I was taking Ryan Garcia at his word, thinking, oh no, I think he really believes what he's talking about. Rather than, no, he's just trolling and he's trying to get everybody to think that he's crazy. But sometimes I step back and I'm like, I, I don't know, because I don't really know what makes the guy tick, you know? And I think that sometimes if we do too much psychoanalyzing, we could miss it, miss everything big time. But there has been 
great unevenness. He's had those two fights with Emmanuel Tego and Javier Fortuna. These were the two fights following the biggest win of his career against Luke Campbell, where the way that he celebrated, you would have thought that he won the Super Bowl. It was a very meaningful win at the time. It had a lot of people certify Ryan Garcia as like the real deal. Like, no, this guy's serious. It wasn't Francisco Fonseca or Romero Duno that he was stopping at this point. It was stopping Luke Campbell with the body shot. Granted, Luke Campbell retired after that fight, but a lot of people who thought that maybe Ryan Garcia was just this kind of model-esque looking fraud. No, I think that that pretty much dispelled those notions. But then he took the layoff. He comes back. He fights two much smaller fighters and he is unable to make 135 so he either has these fights at catch weights or has it at 140 and think about it like Javier Fortuna used to be a featherweight champion so you've got Javier Fortuna basically fighting a 140 guy at somewhere between 135 and 140 what, what am I supposed to make of that? Yes, Ryan Garcia looked great. Yes, he did control the fight with the jab and, you know, surprisingly with a developing right hand, which I was wondering, is he going to be taking that improved right hand into his next fight against Gervonta Tank Davis? Uh, you know, there were some things that I was seeing in that fight against Fortuna. And by this time, this was under the tutelage of Joe Goosen who he has since left, which again, another red flag, like what's up with this kid? He's now like changing trainers. But after that Fortuna win, even though it was a much, much smaller Javier Fortuna, I was thinking, you know, maybe they've got something, a good thing going between Joe Goosen and Ryan Garcia. Joe Goosen had huge belief in Garcia, or at least that's what he would profess. And it seemed like he was developing Ryan Garcia's right hand. So that's in addition to Ryan Garcia's notoriously deadly left hand. So I'm thinking, okay, he's putting some pieces together. So then the, the super fight, Tank Davis versus Ryan Garcia, the biggest commercial fight of the year takes place. And Ryan Garcia goes head over skis trying to attack Tank Davis. I, I ain't gonna lie. In the first round, I was thinking, uh-oh, this is getting interesting because Ryan Garcia was really coming at Tank. And you saw Tank kind of hold in one spot. Looked like he was like, oh, shoot, you know, trying to like weather this early onslaught. And I'm like, oh, okay, what, what's going on? But Tank Davis then kind of lulled him in, lulled him in, blasted him with a counter punch, dropped Ryan Garcia in the third round, I believe, and started to control the fight more from distance, started to outbox Garcia, then stopped him with a body punch in the seventh round. So Ryan Garcia wasn't ready for Tank Davis, but it looked interesting in the opening minute or two. But then it seemed like there was some unraveling after that because then Ryan Garcia and Joe Goosen parted ways. And then he returns to the ring later on, maybe seven months later in December of 2023, he fights Oscar Duarte, this time under the tutelage of Derek James. So it's like, okay, is this one, this pairing gonna work out? So speaking of unevenness, this was a, a weird fight because it was a, a Oscar Duarte who I thought would present some problems because I thought Oscar Duarte had some of the same attributes that Carlos Morales, if you remember that Ryan Garcia fight from 2018 against the shorter, come forward pressure fighter, Carlos Morales, this was a majority decision win for Ryan Garcia. He struggled in that one. And in the post fight, you know, this was early Ryan Garcia before people knew about any, you know, mental health issues. This is when he was like a social media star who was, you know, newly signed, relatively newly signed to Golden Boy. And this was him fighting Carlos Morales. And he was getting booed. He being Ryan Garcia was getting booed in the post fight in ring interview after winning a close majority, a, a very frustrating looking, uninspired decision where Ryan Garcia kind of struggled and never really never really took control of that fight. I thought Oscar Duarte possessed some of those same problems and yes, Oscar Duarte was getting inside on Ryan Garcia, but once he would get inside, Ryan Garcia would almost amateur light show him his back. It started off being like a little shoulder roll, but that incorrect shoulder roll and you know when a shoulder roll goes wrong it could go really wrong watch Andre Berto when he tried to do it against uh Robert the Ghost Guerrero first of all why would you do it against somebody who's coming down the middle with straight left hand so he's doing the shoulder roll he being Berto is shoulder rolling this way but he's shoulder rolling right into <laughs> the left hand of the Ghost Guerrero and he got blasted he got dropped he lost the fight it ended up being a shootout a dog fight but yeah don't try this at home, kids, if you haven't mastered that, you know, Mayweather technique, if you will. But Ryan Garcia started to do it. It didn't seem like it was something that Derry James taught him how to do. But it went from this to this. And when he would do this, 
Oscar Duarte would kind of hit him in his side near his back area. He continuously got warned by the referee. I thought the referee totally mishandled that fight. Ryan Garcia should have been getting warned for showing him his back, not Oscar Duarte for hitting what's available when Ryan Garcia is essentially taking his, his body, his whole body out of the field of play, if you will. It just seemed amateur. It really did. And so it seemed like Garcia started to have trouble controlling the range. Now, some people thought that he was just experimenting with things. Some think that that was Ryan Garcia trying new things out, new strategies, new techniques, seeing what works, what doesn't. Maybe that's the case. I'm just saying from a viewer's perspective, it looked like he was starting to have some trouble with Duarte's pressure. But then you saw Garcia get on the move laterally, like I'm talking about moving to the left, legs wise, moving to the right. Because one criticism that I've had of Ryan Garcia, especially when people would compare him to like Oscar De La Hoya, I'm like, yo, have you ever seen young Oscar De La Hoya fight? Look at how his legs move when he was like a lightweight and 140. And when he was fighting in his, you know, early to mid 20s, look at how he fighting against Rafael Ruelas and uh, Gennaro Chicanito Hernandez, people like that. Look at how his legs moved versus how Ryan Garcia is a lot more flat-footed, is a lot more take one step and slide, take one step and slide. A lot more Adrian Broner-like flat-footedness than Oscar De La Hoya, who was always kind of on the balls of his feet, even when it was just moving in and out. It was a lot more fleet of foot, a lot more light-footedness with Oscar De La Hoya. So yeah, I never really saw that comparison. And plus, just Oscar's use of his lead hand. Yes, Ryan Garcia's got a deadly left hook, but Oscar De La Hoya had a phenomenal left hook and he had a better jab than Ryan Garcia. So he would jab, jab, and then dip, change levels, move with his feet, jab, and then turn that jab and turn it over into a hook. He could do a lot more, I feel, with his lead hand to control the fight. Yes, Ryan Garcia has had moments where he's able to control the fight at range. Oscar De La Hoya, in my opinion, in his 20s was a different animal altogether. But I thought that Ryan Garcia was struggling a bit with Oscar Duarte, but then he started moving to the left, to the right, to where the crowd is booing because he's moving so much. So he would move, 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 and then he would stop and pop with a couple punches. And then in the eighth round, he found an opportunity to get a three-punch combination together, and he clipped Oscar Duarte upside the head with the second left hand that he threw in that exchange. And so he hits him upside the head, Oscar Duarte is clearly out of sorts. He's trying to grab the rope to steady himself, still looks wobbly, gets dropped seconds later, bounces up at the count of nine. It's not good enough for the ref. The ref weighs it off. I thought that it was a weird, it was a weird decision to get up after nine to try to then bounce up and like, hey, I'm okay. It's almost like an unspoken rule. Yeah, look, to get up at the count of eight, to give yourself a time, because what if you get up and you're a little, oh, whoa, you want that extra second to show the ref before the count of 10 that you're okay, right? So I think that you're really, you're really taking a big gamble when you try to get up at nine. Sometimes it works out for you. In this case, it didn't work out for Oscar Duarte. But Ryan Garcia did what he had to do to win the fight. I actually thought that that movement was effective. Even when he was getting booed, I'm like, okay, he went from probably losing a couple rounds in those like what around the fifth six maybe when Oscar Duarte really started to come on I thought that he went from losing a couple of those rounds to winning the rounds in a very boring and unfun to watch fashion but I'm like hey but strategically if you just if you could just disappear the audience and your your goal is just to win the fight your movement is doing that because you've got this guy who's unable to cut the ring off against you and he's just following you. So I've got I've got mixed feelings about that Ryan Garcia performance against Oscar Duarte. Again, the word unevenness comes to mind. So now when I look at Devin Haney versus Ryan Garcia, because Devin Haney has been checking all the boxes, doing everything right, taking care of his body, you know, just being the consummate professional. Versus Ryan Garcia's behavior, I smoke, I drank, I talk about bizarre things on social media, I am looking very unhinged to much of the public to where people are worrying about me. When you look at the perceptions, it makes sense that the betting odds are what they are. Devin Haney is a minus 800 right now. He's an eight to one favorite. Ryan Garcia is a plus 600. So there is a lot of reason to, to believe based on both of these guys' career trajectories, that Devin Haney should have his way with Ryan Garcia. But I just feel like boxing is never that straightforward. I don't think that you could boxing math this one 
in a way that seems so obvious. It seems obvious that Devin Haney should be able to control and at, at, the, at the very least control the rounds, if not stop Ryan Garcia, then to just beat him up maybe in a similar fashion that he did George Cambosos and Regis Progre. And again, only one of these guys has been in the ring with Vasily Lomachenko. But I think that we are counting Ryan Garcia out a bit. And when I think about these two and I think about their histories, I'm reminded of one of my all-time favorite fighters. Sugar Shane Mosley was the lightweight champion for some time. He was like an IBF lightweight champion through several title defenses. I think there were like eight successful title defenses of that IBF lightweight belt all by stoppage and knockout. Shane Mosley was killing it at lightweight. Then he goes up in weight. And he eventually runs into Oscar De La Hoya, like the guy that he had been gunning for, basically the kingmaker of the era. Oscar De La Hoya was the biggest star in boxing outside of the, the heavyweight division is always different. You always have somebody who might be as popular like this was the 90s. So Mike Tyson was still around. But Oscar De La Hoya was the face of boxing of this era. And Shane Mosley wasn't the first to beat Oscar. Tito Trinidad, Felix Trinidad, got a controversial decision over Oscar De La Hoya. Some felt like Ike Quarte might have deserved a decision against Oscar De La Hoya, but the first person to observably beat Oscar De La Hoya to where nobody really has a problem with the decision was Sugar Shane Mosley. So that launched Mosley's career. I mean, hell, look what a victory over Oscar De La Hoya did for Floyd Mayweather several years later. So at this point, Shane Mosley is now in the in the top two, top three discussion for pound for pound best fighters in the sport. It's like Roy Jones, Shane Mosley. So Shane was right there. And then he has three successful title defenses all by stoppage. So think about it. He's got like several stoppages in a row, beats Oscar De La Hoya via split decision. And then he defends that WBC welterweight title three times successfully all by knockout uh, stopping Antonio Diaz Shannon Taylor look at the knockdown towards the end of the first round of that fight and he stopped uh, Adrian Stone then he fights his amateur rival Vernon Forrest who beat him back in the amateurs and Shane Mosley was a big betting favorite going into this pro fight defending his titles against Vernon Forrest and Vernon Forrest drops Shane Mosley early Beats on him throughout the fight, wins a unanimous decision, and Shane Mosley made the decision to rematch him, loses again in the rematch. Mosley is able to win big fights after that, but he's never able to recapture that top of the pound for pound list again. He never recaptured that reputation after getting in there with his rival, Vernon Forrest, the late Vernon Forrest, by the way, died tragically. He got shot in Atlanta at a gas station, I believe. Rest in peace, Vernon Forrest. I think he was in his late 30s at the time. But yeah, Vernon Forrest had his number then. I think it was like in the Olympic trials when they fought as amateurs. And then as a professional, he had his number. These guys have famously, Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia have fought like uh, supposedly, reportedly six times where they reportedly split three to three in the amateurs. So even if their reputations are as such right now, there is a level of familiarity that Ryan Garcia has with Devin Haney. And Devin Haney knows where Ryan Garcia brings to the table. Ryan Garcia has some idea. I know Devin Haney's gotten a lot better, but Ryan Garcia has some idea of what Devin Haney's bringing to the table. I don't think this is as straightforward as Devin Haney just has his way with Ryan Garcia. I'm sorry. Like, and you know what? I, I've seen the their uh, measurables, right? Where Devin Haney, according to Wikipedia, is like 5'9 now. I remember when he first, you know, was a pro fighting in TJ. They had him listed at the time at like 5'7, five, 5'7 seven, five, seven and a half. Ryan Garcia was always a little bit taller than Devin Haney as far as I had seen. And now w Wikipedia has Haney listed at 5'9 and it has Ryan Garcia listed at 5'8 and a half. Whereas BoxRec has Haney at 5'8 and Garcia at 5'8 and a half, which I think is closer to the truth. But what I'm saying is Ryan Garcia isn't the height and doesn't have the reach of Regis Progre. He's a longer, rangier fighter. And I think back to a fight that Devin Haney had 
uh, several fights ago. It was around the time he was fighting guys like Yor Yorkies Gamboa, and he fought Alfredo Santiago. This was around the time Devin Haney had an injury, and he fights Santiago, and he wins just about all the rounds. But you could see that there was something about Santiago's punch trajectory and kind of the wiry uh, nature of Santiago's build that was giving Devin Haney a little bit of a problem early. Again, Devin, Devin Haney won the fight via wide scorecards. But I look at Ryan Garcia and his dimensions and his hand speed coupled with the power. And I'm like, I don't think Devin Haney is just going to be able to keep Ryan Garcia on the outside for 12 rounds and just have Ryan Garcia looking frustrated, unable to get his punches off. I don't see that. Ryan Garcia is very twitchy. He's very reflexive. He's very, if you do something, I'm always ready to do something back. Like he is very reactive and maybe he will overreact to some feints that Devin Haney gives him and maybe he'll pay for that. And to, you know, to be fair, I think that when it comes to inside fighting, I think Devin Haney is the better inside fighter. I've seen Haney fight on the inside against Lomachenko, against Jojo Diaz. You know, I've seen Devin Haney start to develop these different realms and dimensions of his game. Ryan Garcia, again, like the last time I saw him on the inside, he was doing something like this, right? So again, I get it. And there are a lot of reasons to think that Devin Haney should win this fight and should win this fight very convincingly. I am expecting turbulence. I think that there will be moments where Devin Haney takes hard punches and has to maybe tie up. Ryan Garcia might win multiple rounds. We might see rounds where Devin Haney looks like he's winning for some of it. Then Ryan Garcia lets his hands go, catches Haney with something, has some moments. And then, you know, at the sounding of the end of the round, you might get Ryan Garcia in Haney's face yelling and trash talking before they walk back to their respective corners. Can you tell I can't wait for this one? I just don't think that this is as cut and dry as the, the data should tell us right now. I think that there are some intangibles. I think that the familiarity between the two matters. I think that Ryan Garcia's uh, height, reach, and hand speed matter. And I'm not going to make too much of Devin Haney's chin because he had that one moment uh, in the later rounds against Jorge Linares. You know, he got hit by a clean punch. What fighter can you think of who's never been a little bit like, whoa, what happened there? Like, everybody gets hit with something big. And ha have you seen Devin Haney really look like he's in trouble since that several fights ago? I mean, you could argue that in the 10th and the 11th rounds against Vasily Lomachenko, he was having some big issues. I, I would agree. He was getting hit with some really flush shots. I thought that he took them well. I thought that he battled back well, especially in the 12th and final critical round. So look, I'm going to I'm still going to go Devin Haney here. I think that he's going to pull this off. I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, I think that he should win by multiple rounds, maybe eight rounds to four. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a knockdown. I wouldn't be surprised if either of these guys knock the other down, but I'm not expecting a stoppage. I think that there's too much pride between these two. I think that there's too much uh, athleticism and talent, quite frankly, between these two. And I think that they're going to really push each other. In this battle between, we'll say, stability versus chaos, I think that they might meet at an intersection to where Devin Haney has some chaotic moments. And Ryan Garcia might fight in a more stable way than we are than we envision him. Like, look, coming into this one, when I was when I said that I didn't think that this fight was going to happen, I thought that there was a less than 50% chance that the fight was going to proceed. I even like issued out a poll on YouTube saying, does this fight happen? Yes or no? And I think that more people said no than yes, if I recall correctly, especially around that time. Again, it seems like we're in smoother waters, but we don't know what's being kept from us in terms of what's happening behind the scenes. We just don't know. But I, I was thinking that there was a possibility that if Ryan Garcia, if this fight does go through and Ryan Garcia is not right in the head, that we might have like a Oliver McCall moment in the rematch between Lennox Lewis and Oliver McCall. You remember... Oliver McCall uh, surprisingly knocked out Lennox Lewis, the first to do it. It was before the Haseem Rahman knockout of Lennox Lewis. But Oliver McCall dropped Lennox Lewis, knocked him out, takes the titles. And then a couple years later, they rematch. And Oliver McCall was going through some things. And it was one of the weirdest things you'll ever see in the ring. He's pacing back and forth as the fight is going on with his hands down, like down by his side, 
hands aren't up here. He'll put his hands up here for a couple seconds. Lennox Lewis will shoot a couple jabs, and then Oliver McCall will just turn away from Lennox Lewis, walk away with his hands down, kind of sulking, looking like he's breathing hard, almost hyperventilating, just pacing back and forth. Lennox Lewis is looking at the ref like, what's going on? And then he'll kind of like throw a couple like half-hearted punches. Oliver McCall for a second will put his hands back up. Really weird. Look that up on YouTube to the point where the fight ended up just being stopped. The ref's like, uh, to hell with this. We're not going to do that because Oliver McCall was not fighting. He just, I don't even remember how many punches he even threw in that fight. He was mostly just walking around the ring. And then by the time the ref stops it, Oliver McCall breaks out into a full sob. He's just crying. It was so weird. And I, I was thinking, are we going to get something like that to where Ryan Garcia really is not ready to fight and it shows itself in the ring in such a dramatic way? Again, I don't know, but I'm operating under a, a, an assumption, a loose assumption, a loose assumption. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm treating this preview and prediction as if Ryan Garcia is if not totally disciplined, like if he's, he, I wouldn't be surprised if he takes days off, you know, between work. I don't know what his work ethic is day in and day out. I don't know how much control Derek James has on Ryan Garcia's day to day training and behavior, but I'm operating under the assumption that when he enters the ring, that he will fight and he will fight like Ryan Garcia fights. That's what I'm assuming. And if so, I think that this is going to be a competitive fight. I thought it would be a competitive fight back in the day. I think I might have shaded towards Devin Haney winning by decision. I think I'm shading towards Devin Haney winning via decision this time around. And again, I'm expecting turbulence. If Don't be surprised if we see an, an exchange where Devin Haney gets rocked or even put on his butt and then has to kind of tie up, buy some time to recover to then recapture the, the following rounds and then win a decision that way. But I am not so quick to dismiss Ryan Garcia's chances here. So I'm going to take Devin Haney via, I'll say unanimous decision. I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be a split decision. I'll say unanimous decision. What if it's like a majority decision where one person has it like a draw and the other two have it for Devin Haney? But I'm taking Devin Haney. I think that we, the public, are mostly going to see an eight rounds to four type of fight. Might be closer to 7-5, might even be closer to 9-3, but I'm going to put it right around 8 rounds to 4. I think this will be somewhat competitive. I know that a lot of experts think that Devin Haney is just on another level than Ryan Garcia. I think I kind of think that too. I think that he is much more of a sweet scientist than Ryan Garcia, but Ryan Garcia is an athletic fighter. He's a devastating puncher. He's got natural hand speed, and I think that he's got some toughness. I know he didn't get back up when he got dropped by Javante Davis, and you know, if Devin Haney is able to beat Ryan Garcia into like a no moss situation, that would be big. That would be pretty damn major, and it would do a lot to both Devin Haney's reputation, and it would crush Ryan Garcia's reputation. So that is, you know, if that happens, then that's what that is. But I think that this will be a competitive fight that goes the 12 round distance. And I'm taking Devin the Dream Haney to win it. Let me know your thoughts on this showdown. Uh, how do you see the state of the 140 pound division? If Devin Haney wins, where does he go from here? Who do, do you think Devin Haney wins? And do you think that it's as cut and dry as many of the boxing pundits and the boxing public, boxing fans, former boxers, the whole boxing community, do you think it's as cut and dry as many, if not most, are making it sound between these two? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.